Hello, everybody, and welcome to our Euro Wellness Lecture, part of our faculty lecture series. So I am Professor Burns. I'm an English professor here at Moorpark College. So today I was thinking about the idea of wellness. And very often when we talk about wellness, we're thinking about things like you know, your physical health. We're talking about your body, your mental health, psychology. And those are all important aspects of wellness. But the really important point that I'm hoping that you guys walk away with today is the idea of wellness as a composition. Wellness is a process. So I'm an English professor, so I'm going to, to make a lot of analogies to writing and composition itself. Composition is a creative act. Composition, though, is not entirely creative. You're using words that already exist. You're using elements that already exist, but you're using them in a creative way to express yourself. That's your entire life as well. So, as soon as I, there we go. I have three primary goals for this particular talk. In this goal, I want to, I want to teach you guys a little bit about this philosophical context, uh, concept called uh, Cartesian dualism. I want to talk to you about yourself, your life as a composition, and I want you to know that you are loved. So as soon as that decides to work again. We're going to have, thank you. So Cartesian dualism, so this comes from Rene Descartes. Why don't they call it Descartian? I don't know. They just don't. In any case, when I use this word dualism, Dual meaning two, of course. But what we're talking about here is your body and your mind. There's lots of different theories when it comes to this. In philosophy and psychology, we call this the mind-body problem, the relationship between your body and your mind. And are you your mind? Are you your body? And there's never any one correct answer. But what's especially important, especially this diagram is illustrating, is the relationship between uh, the exterior and the interior the mind and the body are related to each other. However, is the mind entirely equipped to perceive the world? That's the question. The world that we see, is it accurate? Is it objectively true? Or is there a matter of interpretation? And if it is a matter of interpretation, then we have some control over that. We don't have control over everything. We don't have control over our genes, except for the ones we buy. We don't have control over our circumstances in a lot of sense, but we do have control over how we perceive them. We do have control over what we do with those circumstances. So the question is this, do you define yourself or do your circumstances define you? So I'm an English professor, so I'm gonna give you a quick little grammar thing. Sorry, you guys didn't know you were signing up for that. Real quickly. In English, there are three parts of a sentence to make a complete sentence. There's the subject and the verb and the object. So I want to talk to you real quick about this concept of the subject and the object. The subject of the sentence is what the sentence is about. It is a noun or a pronoun that's doing something. The object is the thing that is receiving something else. So I'm going to suggest to you, when you define your own life, when you define yourself, you become the subject of your own life. You become the subject of your own circumstances rather than the object. You're not accepting circumstances. You're shaping them. You're doing something with them. So classically, in the old days, this is where we get this idea of the mind-body separation. In terms of Western culture, Western philosophy, Western literature, this has been part of our ideology for a very long time. So here we have, yes, our, our four classic elements here, ye old periodic table. And that's not really what it would look like, by the way. <laughs> anyway, so we have, of course, earth, water, air, and fire. And in classical times, in classical Greece, everything was made of these four elements in some combination. The body had all four, but the body itself was made of earth and water. That was your blood and your bones and all that kind of stuff. But the stuff that's you, the stuff that makes you unique, your sense of consciousness, your sense of self, what we would today call our soul, that was composed of air and fire. So we have this idea throughout our literature that the body is bad, that there's something wrong about it. Right? If we look into Christian theology, Christian ideology, so much of sin is associated with the body. Right? But I'm here to suggest that 
The body and the mind don't have to be separate. They are related. Again, the way you perceive the world is up to you. The way you perceive yourself is also up to you. So there's a poem called Tin Turn Abbey by a guy named William Wordsworth. And one of my favorite lines from this particular poem is, what we perceive, we half create. So you've seen plenty of examples of things like this. I didn't you know, invent these illusions. What do you see here? Tell me, somebody, you know, raise a hand, tell me what you see on, on the left-hand side here. So this is a drawing, but of what? Okay, is that an old woman looking off to the side, or is it a young woman looking over her shoulder? Well, from this distance, I would say it's a younger woman looking okay. to the left. Okay, so show me hands. Who sees the young woman looking over her shoulder? Everybody on that side, that's interesting. Oh, okay, so that's over here now. Um, but what do you, who sees the old lady, though, with the wart on her nose? Yeah, so which one's right? It's up to you. Same thing, the, this one's slightly less famous, but it's also pretty well known. The one on the right, what do you see? Somebody raise a hand, maybe somebody on this side this time. Um, tell me what you see in this photo, on, on this drawing on the right. Well, not necessarily, okay, thank you. I see a duck. You see a duck, okay. Who sees a duck? Who sees a rabbit? Hmm. <laughs> hey, we're going live here. <laughs> it's both. And it's up to you. Which is right and which is wrong, it doesn't matter. It's up to you. Maybe it, it depends on the day. Maybe it depends on the circumstance. Can we have the next slide, please? So, okay, those were illusions made on purpose to mess with your mind. They were using tricks of shading and perspective to try to confuse you. But somehow, we have this idea that, that even so, there's an objective world. There's something out there that I can be sure, this is what I'm seeing for real. So when I'm looking at a mirror, are mirrors 100% accurate? <laughs> you see here the funhouse mirror. Obviously, it's distorted. Obviously, it's going to create a false image. But what's the difference between a, a, a funhouse mirror and, and you know, a regular mirror? It's maybe slightly better at manufactured, but it's still not perfect. It's still not flawless. And we're still going from a three-dimensional you to a two-dimensional image of yourself. You're also looking at yourself in a literal mirror image. What you see is on your right side, everybody else sees on your left side. So who's right? Is the mirror accurate or is it all about how you look at yourself? The mirror can be dangerous. The mirror can be your enemy. Here on the, on the left, we see a very famous painting uh, of this very young girl. And, and at first I thought, oh, this, is, this looks pretty accurate, looks pretty cute when I was looking through this. But then I recognized the detail down in the lower left where she's looking at a fashion magazine. And she's comparing herself to a fashion magazine. Is that a, a healthy way to think of yourself in the mirror? It's not. We know, of course, I hope you guys know, especially in the fashion magazines and the cosmos and all of that, the photographs that you see, they're not real. They're not even close to real, right? First we take someone who was already good looking, then we put all kinds of makeup and lighting effects, and then we take it to Photoshop and then we go to work. Maybe some of you guys are learning how to do some of that kind of stuff. So remember that the mirror is your choice. Can you, do you want to accept that mirror? Is that really part of who you are? Or do you define it yourself? Is your mirror image your friend, or in this case, uh, your, your enemy one we see in the Alice in Wonderland? So let's think about this concept of being more active, composing your mind, composing your own life. So you all have a handout. Um, I have one or a couple extras. Anybody need an extra? Anybody? OK. There we go. So we have a handout. And with your handout, you see there are post-it notes. You have 10 post-it notes. So I'd like you to spend just a minute or two, just really quickly, on your 10 post-it notes, write out things that you have done in the last 24 hours. Just doesn't matter what, just some of the things that you remember doing, I'm sorry, let's make it 48. In the last 48 hours, just think of some things you've done. 
Have you fed your cat? Have you gone to class, one hopes? Have you come to the faculty lecture? That was a good choice, by the way. Just spend a minute or so, your 10 responses here. What have you been doing, or what have you done in, say, the last 48 hours? And then, once you start getting those done, You'll see on the handout here, there's a, a matrix. I didn't invent this, by the way. This is from the, the book, uh, what, the 10 Habits of Highly Successful People or something like that. A lot of those self-help books are kind of meh, but it's kind of one of those things, every now and again, a good idea is a good idea, right? So we'll take a look at this matrix we have here. And we have four quadrants, and they each have their own sort of uh, attributes. So in the upper left, we talk about things, tasks that are urgent and important. Then to the right of that, er, tasks that are not urgent, but they are important. Down to the bottom, urgent, but not important, or not important and not urgent. So once you get your 10 activities done, and I see some of you are already kind of uh, a little ahead of me on this one, so that's great. I want you to take your post-its and put them into the quadrant that seems appropriate. These tasks, were these urgent and important? Were they important but not urgent? Were they urgent but not important? Or, lastly, not urgent and not important? You can just fill in with a, with a pen if that's easier too. But I kind of like the, the, the physical movement of the post-it to illustrate the point. Of course, these are very vague terms, intentionally vague terms. What's important? That's kind of up to you. Is spending time with your cat important? Well, if it makes you happy, sure. Is spending time on Facebook important? Hmm. I guess it depends what you're doing. Did you check your status five minutes ago, 30 seconds ago, and now you're checking it again? Is that important to check it every 30 seconds? Maybe. I don't know. It's up to you, really. But this is kind of what we're getting at. Very often, we have this false impression that these four quadrants should be balanced. We use that word all the time, but wellness, about balance. It should not be balanced. It should not. What should we focus on? I mean, you see it, of course, on the, on, on the <coughs> projector here. But what should we be focused on? Which quadrant? Well, if you flip over to the next page, you'll see I've modified the matrix in a graphical way to kind of show you what we really should be focused on. What we really should be focused on is the quadrant number two, the upper right, not urgent, but important. Focus on the tasks that are important, but we don't got to get them done right this second. Sometimes there are tasks that come up right away, and we call that putting out fires. Yes, there are urgent tasks that are important. We've got to get them done. But after that, then what? Shall we waste time? Shall we be distracted? Or should I focus on my goals? Things that are important but aren't done right this second. Show me a hand. What's the effect of focusing on this idea of important but not urgent? What happens? What, one more for the, for the, for the mic. <laughs> but yeah, you're, you're on the, I can hear that you're on the right track. But we're just waiting for the mic. <laughs> Self-fulfillment. Self-fulfillment, right, so we see that very good. Yeah, yeah. But that's basically it. If we are only running around trying to get things done, if we're putting out fires all day long, what does that do for us? It stresses us out, it tires us out. And so when we do have time just to have some fun, to have something done that's really not that important and not that urgent, but just for fun, but we're too stressed to enjoy it. What's important but doesn't have to get done right this second? The distractions and the frivolities, we don't need them. Sometimes, though, they'll come up. It's OK. Don't feel bad about checking Facebook. Don't feel bad about doing the things in the lower quadrant. But just remember that those shouldn't be the focus. What's urgent? And can you get it done? And once you're done with that, more importantly, what's important but not urgent? Once we start taking control of those sorts of questions, 
Once we start taking control of those circumstances, we start taking control of our own lives. Now we're thinking more deeply about your, your self, your sense of self, your sense of place, your sense of individuality. It's a very American idea, by the way, individuality, but that's okay. So here we see two very famous drawings from, uh, from Escher. They're both, in a sense, self-portraits. The one on the left, kind of in a, in a li very literal sense, it, it's a self-composition. The hand drawing the hand drawing the hand, right? So, <coughs> You create yourself. Being is a verb. To be, to exist, is a verb. You are an active process. Define yourself. We see on the next page of your handout here a list of qualities, and I used that term before earlier in the talk. I talked about the objective self, the self that allows circumstances and others to define self. My job is awful. I don't get paid enough. I don't like my town. These are complaints. But not just complaints, these are things in which you're allowing the circumstances and the people around you to define how you feel. Instead, the subjective self, the one who takes control. These are the traits. We don't have time to go right through all of these, but you can you know, take your time to, to look over these. <coughs> Some of the important ones, though, on the very top, the objective self focuses on his or her weaknesses. I'm not good enough. I'm not smart enough. I'm not educated enough. Focuses on those kinds of weaknesses. Those are harmful. Those are stressful. Instead, we can focus on how to improve. We're not changing the objective facts. I don't have enough education. OK, that's an opportunity. That's a place to improve. That's not something to complain about. Complaints are opportunities. So we're not changing the literal facts. The objective is still objective. The subjective is how you read it, what you do with it. OK. So flip on over to the next page. So we'll spend a minute to, to finish off these two sentences. So I have these two sentences for you um, <coughs> we see in these boxes. When I allow others and circumstances to define my sense of self, I, so when you're the, on the, in the objective mode, when you're in the objective sense, what's the rest of that sentence? Let's take a minute or so to, fin to fill that out. When I allow others and circumstances to define my sense of self, I. And you'll see the one below. When I define my own sense of self, I. What's the difference? So let's hear what you guys were coming up with. When I talk about when you allow others or circumstances to define you, what happens? Somebody share it with us. Okay, you can get the mic over here. <laughs> Come on down. Oh, oh, I had a hand over here? Okay, I'm sorry. Let's we'll start over here. We can go over there. That's great. I just, when I let other people define, I feel less powerful. You feel less powerful? Yeah. Yes, you're the, the subject of, or sorry, you're the object right. of someone else's subjectivity, absolutely. Yes, and over here now. You know, uh, some people with a little less self-confidence may take this criticism very literally, even if it's just, you know, meaningless and they may say ah i see that criticism and now i'm hurt emotionally I see. right so if somebody comes at you and and 
we have all these little moments in our lives where people just say little things, and they probably don't even mean to be harmful or judgmental, but yes, if I define myself based on what others say, then I'm going to internalize that. I'm going to believe it, right? If someone says, uh, how could you be so foolish to make this decision? Oh, I guess I'm foolish. How could you be so unskilled to make this mistake? I guess I'm unskilled. To accept that from someone else, you're, the, you're, you're, you're at the mercy of someone else's definition. Sometimes, that's not necessarily a bad thing. People love you. Your parents love you. Your friends love you, hopefully. But not everybody does. <laughs> so you have to be the one who defines yourself. OK, how about the second one here? Let's get some responses from this. When I define my own sense of self, I, what do we come up with on this one? When I define my own sense of self. So in that instance, I feel the reverse. I feel a little more powerful, like I get to define my own deal. Yes. You can define yourself in lots of different ways. The circumstances are always the same. You have the same genetics. You have the same physical location, although you can move, of course. But you can choose how to interpret the situation. So for example, uh, I might say, I want a promotion at work, and I'm not necessarily going to get it. But as I work towards that promotion, what am I doing? Am I really making an effort to get better at my job? Am I getting, making an effort to learn and to expand as a human being? Maybe I didn't even get the job, because I don't have complete control over that. Of course I don't. That's other, other people. But I can still choose how to interpret that. That process of preparing for that promotion, fighting for that promotion, I have improved as a human being, and I have improved in that particular job, that particular task. So you'll see here on, on this next page, this drawing mannequin, as we're sort of referencing the, uh, the posters for this particular talk today. And I chose this blank figure. So this is a figure, it's called a drawing mannequin. And this is used usually at, at a sculpture, like as a 3D figure. For, for various artists and fashion designers, things like that. But I'm suggesting that you can also think of yourself as this mannequin. You're blank, you're undefined. You can define yourself. Of course, there are circumstances. The mannequin is there. You can change the mannequin. You can change your body. You can change your circumstances. You can't change everything, but you can change how you perceive it, what you do with it. This you need to know. This you need to understand. I said a moment ago, not everybody loves you. That's true. But you are loved. This is important. You start taking control of your own life. You start feeling a sense of self, a sense of place. Understand that you are loved. Then you can start giving it back. Where are you? You're in a community. You're on this campus. You're part of this family. We're all together. Define yourself. We don't let others define you. OK? Questions? And I can keep going. I got more stuff. But I wanted to give you some, some room to take a breath here. I know I went through a lot of material all at once. So what do we think? Yes? Oh, there's the, there's the mic, please. Uh, how do you love yourself? How do you love yourself? That's a really important question. That's, a, that's kind of one of the questions. That goes back to that question of defining yourself. Imagine the kind of person who you love. And kind of imagine the person that you can respect. You know, maybe love is too cliche of a word. Is that, is that too Disney, right? Is that too cliche, too, uh, too naive to say the word love? Maybe I've used the word like respect or compassion. Maybe that works better. How could I respect myself? How can I have compassion for myself? Um, who would you have compassion for? Who would you have respect for? Imagine that person. 
what's the difference between you and that person? Right? And then you could make yourself that. There's a line from the King and I, pretend to be brave and be as brave as you pretend to be. Be the person that you respect and then respect that person. Then you love yourself a little bit more. It's harder. Some of us are more introverted. Some of us are more introspective. We look inwards. Some of us look outwards. Right? So we talk about that introvert and extrovert and all that kind of stuff. And there's no right or wrong when it comes to that. Nobody should feel guilty about that. But we recognize there's different kinds of challenges. If you're an extrovert, you're more likely to allow others to define you. And that can be harmful, as we said. But if you're an, extro or sorry, if you're an introvert, you're also allowing yourself to define yourself. But sometimes, maybe you don't like yourself. You've been taught maybe it's kind of arrogant. It's kind of prideful to say good things about yourself. I struggle with that, to be honest. And it's a struggle. I'm presenting this as if it's really easy. I went through this in like half an hour or so, and I presented, oh, it's easy, it's done, right? No. It's simple, maybe. I don't even know if it's simple, but it's not easy. And the point is it's a process. It is a process. And sometimes we mess up, but it doesn't mean we, so sometimes I'll get angry at myself or I'll get angry at others. I'll forget about the importance of compassion and respect. And I'll get angry over something dumb, somebody cutting me off in the parking lot. And so I'll have a setback, but then I cannot accept that and I can move forward again. I can learn from that experience. I told you I'm gonna keep giving you English analogies. Here's another analogy. In my classes, as some of my students would be able to tell you, writing is a process, it's, a, it's a, uh, an idea I really hammer home on my students. Andrew could tell you that. Your life is also a process. My students write a draft, they turn it in, they get some feedback. They maybe write another draft, we have conversations, we workshop it, they work and work and work. And I tell them nothing is set in stone, nothing is hard to find until the final draft is turned in. And we talk about your life as a text. If we talk about your life as a piece of art, as a composition, well, there is no final, well, there is a final draft, and it is the literal final draft. And you know it's coming. Sorry, I didn't mean to bring it down. <laughs> But that's what gives us our sense of purpose, to know there is a final draft due. So what are you gonna turn in? What are you gonna turn in when the final draft is due? That's a good question, thank you for that question. What else were we thinking? What else were we thinking about the self as composition? The self as creative. Do you disagree? Do you disagree when I say that the world is more subjective than we think? Aren't there just facts? Aren't there just things that exist? What do you guys think? I mean, there are. There are objective facts in the world, sure. There's a certain number of chairs in this room, a certain number of students and, and staff members in this room. True. But that's just data. That's not knowledge. It doesn't mean anything. We're always interpreting, though. What does it mean, this number of students? What does it mean, this number of chairs? That's interpretive, and because it's interpretive, it's up to you. Let me make another analogy. So a few months ago, you might remember the whole thing with the uh, online, with the dress. Is it, is it blue, or is it gold, or white, right? Does it really matter? It was funny how angry people got. No, it has to be this, and it has to be that. Well, why? Why does it have to be one or the other? Why can't it be both? Why can't I decide? To the best of everybody, I decided it was pink. This is how people would react. <laughs> but does it matter? Nah. What does matter? What does matter? What can I do with this information? And then you have control over that. How do I see something? I have control over that. How do I hear it? How do I feel it? How do I relate to it? These are things you have control over, and that's what Descartes was trying to get to. There is an objective world. I'm not so extreme in my philosophy to say that everything is subjective. No, of course not. There, are, there is an exterior world. But I'm saying that as human beings, we're, we're kind of ill-equipped to perceive it completely. Y you can't. Can you see the number of atoms in my hand? Right? Can you really imagine the number of stars in, in the galaxy, let alone in the universe itself, with the billions of galaxies? No, you can't. You really can't. Human beings, we can't do it. So it's always interpretive. What's important? 
And again, where am I in this? You have a choice as a writer how to define yourself. And then you have a choice. What's my contribution to the world? You are loved. You are. What are you going to do with that data? What does it mean? Do you have an obligation to love others? Maybe. It's up to you. I can't tell you what to do. What do you, what do you want to contribute to the world? Most of us aren't going to be the next Steve Jobs or uh, Zuckerberg or anything like that, because there could only be one Zuckerberg, right? <laughs> be a movie out of that, I suppose. But um, all of us do contribute to the world Sometimes in big ways, sometimes in subtle ways, but you are contributing to the world. So your question, your challenge, how? Do you want to contribute something positive and leave a positive mark when you turn in your final draft? Or do you want to do something negative and selfish, enjoy yourself, use up some resources and disappear? Hmm. Something to consider. Let's look at this guy for a second here now. Oops, wrong way. <laughs> so, ah, I'm trying to go back to the, uh, can we go back one? To, there we go, thank you. So, we're thinking about how to define yourself. So let's go ahead and flip back over to our, our, our drawing mannequin. <coughs> Some Sorry. of you guys, you know, you have writing implements with you. Let's take a minute or so, since we do have some time. Let's take a minute to look at your figure. This is you. How would you define you? What would you do with this? You guys have some pens or some pencils. What can you do with this? What can you draw on here? What could you erase? What could you add to define yourself? Now, this is you. This isn't a character that, a fictional character, well, then maybe it is. It's a fictional character we can aspire towards, maybe. Let's just take a moment or so to define yourself. Now, as I am not a terribly artistically inclined person, I wouldn't necessarily draw things on here. I would write character traits next to this figure myself. So that's an option available to you. You can just uh, you know, use some language instead of visual communication at this point. Can we share? Someone wants to tell us what they did or show us? Some very artistic types in here, I can tell. Yes? Maybe we can hold it up for the... Um. Um, I put, I like drove, I put some hair, so like you can see I'm a female. Okay. And then I did a big heart around me, because like, and I'm happy, and then I feel like I have a lot of love in my heart, so I was like, that's like pretty good to divine myself. I yeah, that. I think that's fantastic. And so, yes, we, we, we use the hair, and, and most of us want to put some kind of human features on this, obviously, otherwise we're falling into what's called the uncanny valley, right? It's, it's a little disturbing to see that figure staring at you, right? So we might put a face on it, we might put some hair or some clothes or something, yes, this is fine. But I like what you were saying before, the heart, the love, yeah, it's reciprocal. Your attitude is reciprocal. If we approach the world with a positive and constructive mindset, that's the effect we have on the world around us friends, our family, our work environment. The work doesn't change. The family doesn't change. You're stuck with your family, sorry. <laughs> but you can change the effect that you're making. But the opposite is also true. The opposite is also true. If I walk in with a negative attitude and I'm bringing everybody else down, mm. that makes my job harder, it makes my relationships more difficult, it makes me less successful, well, me personally as an educator. I have tough days. I come into work tired and things like this. My students don't see it. Right? We have fun. <laughs> <laughs> yes? Um, I think I'm going to 
He's required to say yes. I didn't mean to pick on you, Andrew, but you're my only student here, so. <laughs> this is good. What else? What else to, can, can share? Again, you can just describe or, okay. So we have a, another one over here. Oh, well, yeah, I, I see you holding it up. <laughs> well, you know, I kept mine very simple. Um, on, on mine, all I did was add the holy girl from Indiana Jones <laughs> because it... So you've chosen wisely. Uh, yes, yes, because... <laughs> It symbolizes a lot of things, such as adventurousness and <laughs> bravery and self-love. Yes. So simple, I, but empowering. I like that. Yes. I like that. So we, we talk about that as, as economical sort of symbolism. That's mm -hmm. very good. Mm -hmm. Yes. Was there anything else you put out there? Was that what you were getting at? Uh, that, that was it. That was it. All right. Very good. Thank you, though. Yeah, we don't have to make things too complicated for ourselves. We don't have to make things too uh, overwhelming. Focus on simple goals. What are you trying to accomplish? On the blurb for this talk, I talked about the relationship between mind, body, and soul. And when I talk about your soul, I don't necessarily mean it in, in a religious sense, although it can be. If you feel that that's the appropriate usage of that word, go ahead. But even my soul is, is different than your mind, though. There's another philosophy, monasm, which is basically this idea that we can only exist in our own minds. We're impossible to go outside of our own minds. But part of that idea also is this question, well, wait a second. So you have a mind, your thinking process, but you also have an ability to think about your thinking. I call that metacognition. Who's doing that thinking? Who's doing the defining? Who's actually in charge? If you're able to recognize your own mind, if you're able to recognize your own perceptions and step outside yourself, wait a second, who's that then? So in some senses, some theological scholars say, well, that's God. Some people say that's your soul. Some people say that's an uh, extra level, like a metaconsciousness, right? Whatever term you want to use, but that's something we can be aware of, our relationship to that extra self, that subconscious maybe, unconscious sometimes. How do you relate to that person, to that force? So this person should be your ally. This some person should be someone you agree with. But this is the person who's really in charge of defining the world around you. But it's still you. Your relationship between your body and your soul and your mind. Your body is here. It has to do with perceptions. It's how you interact with the world. Your mind is the interpretive apparatus. What does it mean? How do I react? But you also have your metaconsciousness, your soul. And that's the one really doing the final draft writing, the final revisions and editing. So that's your challenge. How to do that in a positive way. Do we have any other, any other drawings, any other uh, representations here of self? Yes, great. Um, this is not necessarily, it's things that I also want to work on too as mm. well. It's just, I drew a rainbow and a heart because I just want to be more happier and find love in places that it shows even within myself and a happy face for laughter. Great. I want to live happily. That's, that's great. And so you're thinking in terms of goals, in terms of something to work on, something to work towards. And that's the important thing, especially for, for so many of you who are so young. Oh man, we're just getting started. You guys are still on the rough draft. You guys are still pre-writing. <laughs> I'm sort of on my fifth revision at this point, <laughs> but um, I just turned 25 the other day for about the 10th time, so. Um, <laughs> yes, it is a process, and it's a goal we're aiming towards, defining yourself, but again, yeah, it, it's, that's a, an ideal that we strive towards, and that's the point of ideals. They, they shouldn't be easy to achieve. They should be easy to see but not necessarily easy to achieve because then you're just done, blah, and you're done. You're never done. You're never done. You're always moving. This is what uh, Lao Tzu says in the Tao Te Ching. He talks about movement is associated with life. Flexibility is associated with life. Death is stiffness. Death is when we stop growing. And that's it. We're always growing. We're always moving. So, I do have some homework for you, because I'm a teacher. <laughs> you 
Now this is of course optional. I have no way of actually seeing if you do this homework or not. <laughs> Although, you know, if you want to check, you know, my, my, again, Professor Burns, you can, you, you can get my email from the, uh, from the website if you want to email me and let me know how this went. I would be interesting actually to see if you guys give me some feedback. By the way, it's just uh, uh, Brian underscore Burns two at, at VCCCCCCCCCD <laughs> at uh, <laughs> .edu. So, <laughs> you put them all down, good, okay. Give me the exact number. <laughs> Here's your homework. Think of the people in your life. Think of the people who make a positive contribution to your life. The people who are important to you. So of course your family, of course your friends, of course your teachers, your neighbors, your coworkers or fellow students. These are important people and of these people, who have had a positive impact on your life, I would like you to tell you, to tell them in some way, in some small way, that you love them. Now, these are people that you normally don't say this to. Of course, you say, oh, I hope you say this to your parents plenty of times, <laughs> and your pets and things like this. Someone who you don't, someone you love, think of someone you love, but you haven't really said that. Now, you don't have to w use that actual word, because as I said, it makes us a little uncomfortable, especially in our very, Mm, cynical times, right? Especially where we are right now. Nah, it's kid stuff, that's Disney stuff, right? So instead of using those literal words, although you can, please feel free to use that term. I love you. <laughs> but you could say something else. I appreciate you. I appreciate what you've done. You've added to my life in a positive way. <laughs> that's from the uh, Wonderful World song, right? I see friends shaking hands, saying, how do you do? They're really saying, I love you. It makes me happy to approach the world this way. I don't see any other purpose, any other reason to, to not be happy. Why not? That seems silly to live your life being unhappy. My life isn't perfect. I'm pretty lucky, though. I'm lucky in a lot of ways. My life isn't perfect. I don't have everything I want, but... I do have love, and I can share that. I think you should too. All right, thank you guys. So, I wanted to thank the, the staff and the students here who were putting together uh, all of this uh, high technology stuff for us. And I wanted to thank the, the art staff and the photography studio for the, the, the poster design for this particular talk. And, uh, <coughs> Excuse me, I wanted to thank the, the faculty lecture series, the year wellness series. Remember that there are some other events coming up. We have uh, an emergency preparedness uh, uh, lecture coming up, so that's definitely worth checking out. That has a limited seating as well, so you know, get on early on that one. Next semester, there's going to be some more as well, so keep your eyes open. Um, I'm really glad that you guys came here. Now, I know a lot of you were obligated to be here, but even so, <laughs> I'm glad you came, and I hope you take advantage of everything else we have on the campus. We have so many services for you guys. We want you to be successful, not just for your grades. Of course we do this, that, but health services, mental health services, career services, transfer services. You guys know we have a whole office just for um, scholarships? Whole office, go check it out. I'll give you some money. <laughs> so thank you guys, thank you again.